So first of all, so grateful to have Dr. Uh, Begrini join us here this evening. Uh, throughout our presentation, uh, we'd love to hear some questions, so please feel free to use that chat, and we'll definitely get to it when we can. Uh, and if we miss any of those questions, we'll definitely hit them at the end. Um, so, so that gets kind of popped up here. Perfect. Uh, oh yeah, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so today we want to discuss the winter athlete, uh, their return to sport, and the possible injuries that we typically uh, encounter. We want to discuss the prevention of those injuries, as well as the recovery and return to sport following those injuries. Next slide. So the most important thing that I can say today in order to reduce the risk of injuries in the young athlete is to not specify in the sport too young. It is so important to keep young athletes involved in more than one sport to avoid things such as burnout and overuse injuries. Uh, I know this isn't always easy, uh, but if not involved in another sport, at least do an alternative workouts, including lifting weights, running, swimming, something that stresses those structures from their sport that's different. So that way they're not always for 12 months out of the year utilizing those same structures. Next slide. Uh, so the first sport that I want to go over is the skiing. Uh, the most common injury among skiers is the MCL injury, whether it be a strain or a tear. But what is this MCL? So the MCL is one of those four major ligaments in the knee. It connects the thigh bone to the shin bone and prevents that knee from bending inward. Um, it's, it's one of those things that if we didn't have it, we would have incredible instability in the knee. That would be notable uh, throughout most sports. So how does the MCL get injured? So it's usually an isolated incident or it happens in sports where there's excessive force on the medial, the inside of the knee. Um, below here, you'll see the different classifications, uh, but I think Dr. McGreen can elaborate a little bit more on the different classifications of those strains, as well as maybe the procedures that she may perform in the office, depending on the severity of those injuries. Yeah, so I think the most important is trying to get a good history from the patient. So how the patient presented, what they were feeling at the time of injury, what they were doing at the time, and then sort of some of the changes that they've seen clinically, meaning did they have any swelling? Were they able to walk after the injury or were they feeling really unstable and or not able to bear weight on the leg? So this part of the history is really important just to get us thinking. During the clinical exam, the biggest thing is we're going to check the whole joint itself. So obviously you're going to palpate major bone landmarks to make sure there isn't any specific bony tenderness. And then we want to check all those four major ligaments plus the meniscus on exam. We want to make sure that if there is instability, that we want to pinpoint where the instability is coming from. And if there's no instability, we just want to get a feel for where the patient is having most of their discomfort. So the initial exam will be pretty simple. You know, we kind of want to make sure the patient can weight bear accordingly. If not, that's always a big concern for us. Then we usually lay the patient supine or on their back on the exam table. We're looking for things like color changes, redness, warmth of the joint, and or any sort of sign of swelling. Whenever the joint itself is swollen, that's always a red flag for myself and many of my colleagues, just because the joint doesn't swell for any reason whatsoever. It usually swells when there's a pretty decent or moderate injury to the knee. And when there is swelling within the joint, our first concern is that there could be intrinsic compromise to one of those major stabilizing ligaments and or the meniscus, which most people would consider the shock absorbers of the knee. So we'll sort of divvy out our exam to test both the inside medial collateral ligament, the outside lateral collateral ligament, and then the main two ligaments that cross in the center of the knee, the ACL and the PCL. Once we sort of have a good opinion of what those ligaments feel like, then we'll go through and sort of push our way through the elements of the meniscus that are palpable, and then sort of do a couple of what we call provocative measures to see if some of the maneuvers cause pain to suggest that there could be a tear in some of those structures. When you're looking at the classification, the most mild MCL sprain is a type one. On exam, 
those ligaments will hurt to the touch, but they usually do not open up or show any sign of laxity. And so I can test that in the office, which is really nice. Type two is more of a moderate injury. There's clearly gonna be pain on palpation, but there also is gonna be some laxity. Now, every patient's different, especially depending upon the age of the patient. So what I usually do is always check the contralateral side. Since they brought the control with them, we might as well see what's normal for them and then compare the injured side against the non-injured side. And that gives me a good understanding about if there's true laxity or if the amount of looseness that I feel is just relative to the patient. Type three, I don't see very often. These can become surgical issues because more of the ligament, if not the entire ligament, is torn. And so there is a lot of laxity, clearly will be palpated on exam and, and felt. And most often than not, the patient will feel pretty unstable. So those usually do require secondary imaging such as an MRI to verify the degree of injury, but most of these don't require further imaging unless we think there's another component like a meniscus or potential ACL injury that is going on at the same time as the MCL. So the next thing we want to go over is the prevention of these MCL injuries. Now you can't always avoid having an MCL tear if it's a contact uh, injury or even like a terrible fall. But there are definitely steps that you can take to avoid those non-contact injuries, such as you've seen skiing. Um, so the skier does place a larger stress on the MCL due to the mechanical load while they're uh, changing directions on the slopes. Um, you'll see definitely a higher risk in the more novice skiers. Uh, as they tend to load more on one foot versus the other, uh, whereas the more expert skier will typically keep their skis together, and so it's a little bit more distributed load. Um, so the ways to reduce the risks are kind of as follows. Um, I cannot stress this one enough, but and, and it won't be the first time you see it in this presentation, but strengthening is the absolute best way and the best thing that we can do to keep our ligaments healthy. Um, and so when you're doing your strengthening, the things we want to focus on uh, are single leg activities for the skier, because if you're doing double legged exercises and one leg truly is stronger than the other, uh, you won't necessarily be able to see those deficits because you'll be able to compensate. Uh, but then other ways too are, are lifting heavy weights, doing things like squats and deadlifts, uh, and then also working on our core strength. And this often gets neglected. Uh, other ways to prevent that injury too uh, is having good technique. So keeping feet together, uh, having bent or quote unquote soft knees, uh, and then learning how to fall in a somewhat controlled fashion. Um, improving our flexibility, especially in the hips, uh, working on plyometrics, so jumping, agility, lateral movement, uh, and then always warming up prior to the first run. Uh, 10 years ago, if I went out skiing, I'd be sitting in the car for an hour and a half and then headed to that first run and probably would end up being fine. But it's so important to start those habits young and learn to do those sort of dynamic warm-ups uh, that just gets the, those tissues loaded. Um, and then, so when it comes to returning to sport following the MCL injury, uh, there are definitely things that we want to be focused on. Uh, at times, like if if the injury requires surgery or bracing, like we have to get through those initial phases first. Uh, but then your typical rehab program is going to focus on the mobility, the strength, and those lower chain mechanics, but that isn't enough to return to sport. Uh, when we're assessing an athlete for the return to sport, uh, it's so important to cover the bases, like clinically pain-free, full range of motion, proper strength, and then the condition as well. Uh, but like I said earlier, strength is likely the most important thing that we have to focus on. Strength deficits is the most common reason for people to be delayed in return to that sport. Uh, and, they, and the literature shows that we want to achieve 90% of strength compared to the unaffected side. Um, and that's why it's gonna take some time in order to return the athlete to its to the prior level of that sport. Um, on the next slide here, we'll see uh, the typical timeframes. Um, now this is what the most 
common literature shows right now, but obviously every case is a little bit different. Uh, but with your grade one uh, strains, you're looking over a week before returning back to sport. Your grade two, now we're looking almost three weeks uh, because we have to allow for that ligament to heal, but also to make sure uh, that inflammatory response is, is completely uh, diminished as well. Uh, and then your grade three, again, we're looking over nine weeks. It all depends if, if surgery is necessary. And then with grade threes too, you have to be aware uh, of the meniscus as if that ligament does tear, it does connect a little bit to that medial meniscus and it could affect that, that length of time healing. So that would just complicate things even more. All right. Uh, and then the next athlete that we're gonna look at is the hockey player. Uh, so groin strains, and hip pain is the most common complaint from any hockey player. Uh, there are so many different pathologies that can lead to hip pain or even mimic hip pain, uh, such as adductor strains, hip flexor strains, hip impingement, uh, or even sports hernias. Uh, and again, I think Dr. McGreeny can do go a little further in depth uh, into what she kind of sees in the office with, with these sort of complaints. Yes, yeah, so if you can go to the next slide just for a second. <clears throat> So again, same thing, like I cannot underestimate how important it is to take a really good thorough history just to get a feel. Obviously, if this is an acute injury, so we're to go through what happened at the time of the injury, but most of the ones that I see tend to bear on the side of overuse, being chronic greater than six we weeks or have sort of been intermittent off and on and then maybe recently exacerbated. Obviously, it's not just a hockey injury, but these are very common in hockey. The simple fact that the mechanics of hockey is very different with the whole skating maneuver, stressing different muscles in and around the pelvis and core makes the hockey player more prone to this. When you're running though, jumping, any sort of cutting and pivoting sports, obviously you're in a single leg stance more often than not. And sort of these adductor muscles act as main stabilizers for the overall trunk and lower extremity. So they are sometimes underpowered because they're not one of the routine exercises that people typically think of in their strength training regimens. And yes, they're so important to stabilization. So for me in the office, after we take a pretty good history, I'm really trying to parse through, do I think this is sort of a structural issue? Does it have something to do with the architecture of the hip socket, if you will? Is the patient having a shallow hip socket, meaning that the ball of the thigh bone is not being well covered by the socket and sort of it has some degree of motion or insecurity within the joint? Or do I think the hip socket is large and it's over covering the head ball and creating what's called a pincer or femoral acetabular impingement where the socket hits up against the thigh bone and creates pain and sometimes what's called a cam deformity, which are other structural changes that we can work up in the office. If I don't think it's structural and the x-rays look fairly good and unremarkable, then I start thinking about all the other tissues in and around the hip socket. And it can be really challenging because some of the main structures like the hip flexors, iliopsoas, and a couple of the other muscles that flank the top of the socket lie in such close proximity to the socket itself that it can be really difficult to tease through all of it. And sometimes these problems are multi-tiered because they've been, again, chronic or ongoing for months, if not longer, that it's not just one thing. There's kind of multiple layers to the onion, and we're sort of just trying to peel these layers back to get to the root of the issue. So exam, exam again, is just so important. Clearly, at that point, you want to do all internal and external range of motion of the hip, flex the hip, extend the hip, see how it moves. Again, compare it to the contralateral side. I usually ask athletes all the time if they feel like they have a dominant side. After I do range of motion, I like to do strength tests just to see, again, what muscles are sort of firing and how they fire with relationship to the contralateral side. And then I do some provocative or special tests to see if I can tease out which structures are more affected during the exam. A lot of times there is no swelling, there is no bruising. You're not gonna see any signs of any structural changes on the exam but that can vary greatly too. I will say the one caveat is the hip is one of the later areas to fuse from a growth perspective. There are a lot of major attachments of big muscle tendon units that then attach to the front or um, anterior aspect of the pelvis. And sometimes you can get irritation of those growth areas because the area is still cartilaginous for a large majority of 
middle to late adolescence. But over time, if the area is a little weakened from overuse, some of these patients are prone to acute avulsion fractures where there's a, a, de um, sorry, a definitive moment where the patient is either mid-stride or has a rapid flexion contracture of the muscle tendon, and it can actually pull a fleck of that growth plate or apophysis from the main bone. So sometimes, again, these, these injuries are layered, an acute on a chronic issue or one or the other. And it's my job to kind of parse through all the symptomatology, all the exam findings, and sort of come to a conclusion about where I think most of the pain is coming from. Then we'll start using some conservative measures to treat, but a lot of times kiddos are gonna have to back off their sport because sport clearly aggravates these structures. It takes a really long time to go through rehab if you're constantly hurting the structure in play. So if it's an adductor or sort of an inner groin strain in hockey, skating by itself at a low steady pace may be okay, but any sort of explosive, dynamic, accelerating, or more specifically decelerating activity is gonna require that muscle and that tendon to fire and to work. And if it's already strained and inflamed, you're slowing potentially your recovery by aggravating it persistently in season. So although it's not my favorite part of the job, I do usually rest or relatively rest athletes from their sport while we're trying to tee them up in physical therapy, overcome some of their inflexibility issues, really work on some of the soft tissues in the surrounding musculature, tuning them up, making them strong, and making sure that even if they're not, quote, weak, the balance between muscles is really um, more on a level playing field. And then once they're strong, then we can really start adding in those sports specific skills again, the cutting, the pivoting, more the dynamic stuff, and then get them into explosive activity so that we do return them to sports safely and with a good chance of success so they're not hiccuping in and out of practice and games with repetitive pain. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to preventing those injuries, like strength, again, is going to be one of those absolute keys. Um, and I, I believe like there's a status that strength deficits are that are the leading cause for adductor strains. Um, and if there is a poor or a weak adductor to abductor ratio, so from groin muscles to your glute muscles, uh, if there's a, a huge offset ratio there, then you're at higher likelihood of straining your groins. Um, the, the focus of our strengthening when it comes to injury prevention uh, is going to be geared towards the posterior chain, as such as the glutes, but as well as those adductors. Uh, and this can be achie achieved again by lifting weights, performing resistance band exercises, uh, and improving like mechanics such as deadlifts. Um, I want to mention here, though, that everyone's anatomy is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so if there's performing an activity like a squat or a deadlift where there is impingement, we would have to modify those uh, exercises that gear towards the anatomy of the patient. Um, and so avoiding like the, the pinching sensation in the groin uh, is probably like the number one thing that we want to focus on when it comes to those sort of exercises. Uh, and then we want to strengthen those adductors. So the adductors play a key role in the stabilization of the pelvis. Uh, so when you're doing an activity like a squat, those adductors are going to kick in to help provide some stability. But if they're weak, that's where they get overused and that's where they get injured. Um, and so to improve those, we can do things such as kind of a wider stance squat or a wider stance deadlift. Um, we can also do it with strengthening with things like the Copenhagen plan. Now, if you've never seen a Copenhagen plank, um, you should Google it because it's not an easy exercise to do, um, but it's one of the best ones to activate those adductor groups. Um, and then again, looking at things like improving the hip mobility, so making sure they have uh, the range of motion to even tolerate some of these activities. Um, and then most coaches run their athletes through some sort of dynamic warm up 
prior to the practice of the games. And it should include a lot of dynamic movement, not static movement. Um, and, and by warming up those tissues and, and utilizing those tissues, that's another way that we can help reduce some of those muscular strains. Um, and then when it comes to returning to sport, we want to hit uh, these major things. So again, clinically pain free. So everything that we do in the clinic, we want to have that level where they don't experience the pinch and they don't experience that pooling sensation in the in the adductors. Uh, and that allows us then to get into more of the controlled sports training. So we can mimic a lot of those activities that they do on the ice here on land as well. Um, and then getting them back into full team training for including contact unrestricted practice uh, before letting them back into their sport. Um, and there's a stat that reaching clinically pain free before returning to sport is a good indicator of low re injury risk. Uh, however, um, progressive loading can be beneficial as well. So there are studies that suggest that early loading, running, and sport specific movements with some but definitely minimal discomfort while progressing to more advanced loading in later stages could lead to a faster and safer return to sport. However, it depends on what that injury is if we're, and also depends on again, the age of the patient and what development is going on. Um, and so we look at all those things before we decide like, hey, is it OK to push through some pain? Is it OK to start challenging the, these things in a little bit different way? Um, oh, and then we can actually skip a couple slides. All right. And then the final athlete that we want to go over today is the volleyball player. Uh, the volleyball player is at a higher risk of rotator cuff injury uh, as it is an overhead sport such as baseball and tennis. Uh, you will most commonly see uh, these injuries occur during the serve or, the, or spiking the ball. Um, and it's also possible uh, that the rotator cuff is being stressed more if there's a weaker core and lower extremity as 85% of the force required to hit a ball is generated from the legs and trunk. Uh, so Dr. McGreeny is going to now explain a little bit more on the anatomy of the shoulder and those muscles of the rotator cuff. If you can go one more slide. Okay. Um, so again, I do mostly pediatric and adolescent sports medicine. So I'm fortunate in that rotator cuff tears are not really anything that I see in the office, thankfully, unless there's kind of like an extreme high energy fall or trauma Again, there can be dysfunction of the rotator cuff. There can be tendonitis of the rotator cuff, but almost never do they tear, thankfully. Um, and so the biggest thing is, again, trying to really parse through what's going on. Shoulder injuries can be a, a, a huge variety of pathologies. I see it in the overhead athlete, like the baseball pitcher, right, where they kind of have a lot of overuse and potentially even acute issues, but more often than not, they're being overpitched or they're not maintaining ball or pitch counts. Sometimes they do keep pitch counts, but then they're not factoring in all the bullpen and warm up exercises that they're doing. Sometimes it's the type of balls that they're throwing. So they're sort of throwing a lot of change ups over fastballs or sliders, and that can sometimes stress. Sometimes it's mechanics and they're young kiddos and they're just trying to figure out pitch mechanics to begin with. And some of them are dropping their elbow and throwing a little bit more side, on, side, side arm. Sorry. So you're kind of trying to parse through what makes this injury unique to the sport that the patient is doing. Then other major areas that I see is when you're doing a lot of weight bearing through the upper extremity. So when you're a gymnast or even sometimes a tumbler in cheerleading, you're doing so much body weight through the upper extremity that sometimes the patient will come in with like wrist or elbow issues, but more often than not, the issue is stemming from weakness around the shoulder blade and the rotator cuff muscles. And sometimes we also see it having sort of this, as John was saying, a longer kinetic chain where it starts with the core, the core's not as strong as it potentially it could be. And then if your core is your platform, then everything above and below it is not functioning at an ideal mechanical uh, range. And so as a result, then more forces are being thrown at muscles that shouldn't have to handle it on a routine basis. 
So in the office, again, if it's more of an overuse injury, we're checking range of motion. Range of motion of the shoulder is luckily a major asset to why throwers can throw so well and get into those extreme abducted, externally rotated positions. Um, the shoulder is not a very, it's a ball and socket joint, but it's not a well covered ball and socket joint. So it almost modifies more to look like a golf ball on a golf tee where the actual socket is fairly flat and only about 15 to 20 percent of the head ball touches the socket. So most of the stability of that joint is gained from the labrum, which is fibrocartilage that kind of wraps around the socket and deepens the socket from some of the ligamentous structures in the area and then from the four major rotator cuff muscles. The rotator cuff muscles are unfortunately not well trained in our youth athletes if they're ever even trained. Sometimes if you get into specific nuanced pitching or you work with a, a baseball um, pitcher or a strength and conditioning coach, they'll key the athlete into really doing some of these TheraBand and exercises that John is gonna get into. But overall, I would say the rotator cuff muscles are underdeveloped in a variety of our athletes. And the other muscles that closely associate with the rotator cuff are all those around the shoulder blade. A lot of our postural stability muscles, um, muscles that connect to the spine and around the outside part of the rib cage are all very important for stabilizing that region of our thoracic uh, chest wall, as well as our shoulder blade. The shoulder blade is intimately involved in the shoulder joint itself. The two do not work separately, but always work together. So when you think about strength of the shoulder, you can't just think about, you know, pecs and um, you know, chest press, you can't just think about overhead press and deltoid muscles and biceps and triceps. You really have to work the entire circuit to make sure that all those muscles are really functioning at their peak potential. And then range of motion obviously has a huge implication. If you can't get into range of motion that you need for throwing, or if you're not balancing equally on the upper extremities when you're doing back handsprings and round off back handsprings, then you're going to struggle to load the joint appropriately. And then you're going to force strain through tissues that, again, have no business handling that volume over and over again. So there are ways to tease out which rotator cuff muscles are involved. And thankfully, most of the range of motion in the office is normal, but strain testing can be pretty eye-opening as to where the deficits lie. And then we just go through and correct those. Unless there's extreme issues like dislocation or, or overt laxity of that joint, most of the time, I don't have to get imaging up front, but if there is any sort of trauma, bony tenderness, or concern around growth plates in our youth athletes, then x-rays can be very important and very um, forthcoming with information for our young players. Yeah, when, when we start looking at the function of the rotator cuff muscles, like they're their individual or independent actions are just to do shoulder rotation. But what they're really uh, most important for is stability of the shoulder. So when we are doing things like reaching overhead or, or spiking a volleyball, it's those rotator cuff muscles that help provide a lot of that stability to the shoulder. And if there is weakness there, then that's where they're so susceptible to injury. Uh, but again, that also includes a lot of those stabilizer muscles too, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit here in a second. Um, so when it comes to strengthening of the rotator cuff muscles, they do respond really well to resistance bands. Um, we don't need to do a ton of, of heavy lifting to engage those muscles. It's more the endurance side of things because they need to be on at all times. Um, and then following that too is mechanics of the shoulder. So scapular dyskinesia is kind of the, the abnormal movement of the shoulder blade when that shoulder is in motion. Uh, a lot of our available shoulder motion actually comes from the shoulder blade itself. So if, if there's a weakness there or uh, if there's restriction with that motion, then again, we're gonna be stressing those structures like things like the rotator cuff more than what they need to be. Um, and again, like these things don't get addressed necessarily uh, in the young athlete and some that we want to start them young with and teaching them like hey like these are exercises that you need to include with like your other strength or with your other activities even if it's just part of the warm-up as well uh, so 
when it comes to rehabilitation following a rotator cuff injury, uh, again, it's important to talk about the shoulder strength, but the shoulder strength through the range of motion. Um, it's it, You can be strong with your elbow by your side, no problem. But when you start lifting overhead uh, and that rotator cuff hasn't been tested in those ranges, then it is going to be weak and, again, more susceptible to that injury. Um, and, again, we talked about doing the resistance training uh, and, again, focusing on a lot of the endurance side of things. Um, and, and in doing that, like you're, you're addressing those st stabilizers as well. So, uh, the muscles that surround the shoulder blade, uh, and act almost more accessory, like those are still ones that we want to focus on and improve their strength. And so there's so many times that, that I'll have a patient and be like, oh, Hey, why are we doing this exercise? It doesn't really have to do anything with, with what I do, but it does because like, even though the, the direct motion that we're working on, isn't exactly what you do in the sport. It's those muscles that contribute and help accept or uh, help assist those other muscles that you are using. Um, and then again, core strength, like it, it gets neglected with every athlete. Um, and it's something that like we all need to work on. Um, and when it comes to, especially those young athletes starting those habits young, uh, there, there's almost no risk to doing core exercises because it's all body weight. Um, and so by, by progressing that and improving that, we see those patients get back into their, their normal level and their normal uh, level of performance. Um, so that is all that Dr. McGree and I have to say today. Uh, thank you guys all so much for, for taking the time. We really hope that we pro provided some relatable information, uh, things that you can take away with you. Uh, up next is gonna be Julie, uh, and she's gonna be talking about building a performance plate. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and thanks, you guys. That was really a good, a, a great program. And I appreciated all the information. And I have some of my own questions to ask you at the end. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, OK, so building a performance plate. So next slide. Um, I'm a registered dietitian here at IRG. And tonight I'm going to cover carbohydrates, which are more your energy enhancing foods, proteins, which are more like those muscle building recovery type foods, fruits and veggies, which are more like the anti-inflammatory type of foods, fats or more of those flavor boosting or immunity boosting foods, and then some resources at the end because there is so much misinformation out there that I like to provide resources to help you be able to find some accurate nutrition information. So next slide. So this slide just gives examples of different performance plates. And the reason I'm showing this is that it's the patients I see, every person that comes through the door, they might have different diagnoses, they might have different goals set, and um, but, or I'm sorry, they might have the same diagnoses, but I can come up with a completely different performance plate for them. And it just goes to show it depends what sport you're in. It depends what time of year you are. Are you off season? Are you on season? Um, so examples, these are just some of the examples out there. Um, this shows like the if you're trying to do kind of a maintenance program or more of a moderate workout, then you're going to be seeing more of that 50% veggies and fruit, which is the yellow then the 25% protein and 25% um, starch, which is more like those grain-based carbs. Um, but if you're trying to gain muscle or you're trying to do more heavy training, you're going to increase the protein, right? And you can then decrease the carb. Um, I'm sorry, increase the carb slightly, but <clears throat> decrease that vegetable and fruit part of things. And fats are not part of this, as you can see, but fats are an important part of the performance plate. Um, and we'll get to that near the end of the program. Um, and then lastly, if you're trying to more lose weight or on your rest days, then you can um, decrease that carb load a little bit more compared to um, that starch load. I keep calling it carb load, but the starch load. Um, and um, so anyway, this is just a few examples of different types of performance plates, depending on um, the sport and where you are in your training um, and what those goals are. So let's go here. Next slide. So if we look at the carbohydrates, and I'm just going to look briefly, um, there is a lot of, I would say, I have patients coming in that are saying I can't eat carbs, and I just like to encourage people 
to enjoy carbohydrates. And um, they are the main source of energy for not only your um, for your body and for your brain. And they help in a lot of different areas that people kind of forget. They help you maintain the intensity, especially for things like skiing or for things like hockey. Or I'll say if it's a close hockey game and at the end of that game, it's not really who has the most talent. At the end, it's who has fueled themselves well enough throughout that game so that their brain is still working really well because you know that you have to be on target to be able to get that goal. Or if you're the goalie, you have to be on to be able to, to get the puck. And so, um, and if the brain's kind of diminishing with energy, you're just not going to be able to respond as quickly. Um, it also, be, it can prevent muscle breakdown and it assists in maintaining your hydration level. And if you're slightly dehydrated, which can be even just a one pound weight loss during that game. And if you're sweating heavily in that heavy, I'll use hockey gear again, just because we're kind of in this winter sports season, um, that can affect your performance. And um, so when it's so preventable, so it's like, gosh, if we can keep these things going. So let's talk a little bit about what type of carbohydrates I'm referring to. Um, so we're looking at the 100% type of grains, whole wheat, breads, bagels, tortillas, pitas, breads, and crackers are just some of those examples. The fiber in the products helps you maintain, um, it helps slow down how fast the, the food leaves the stomach. So it doesn't hit the blood really quickly and it prevents that very quick um, increase in blood glucose and then decrease. Instead, you have a steady stream of energy, which is not, uh, which is very helpful for your muscles and it's also very helpful for your brain. Um, there's some other examples here, the brown rice, the whole grain pastas, quinoa, barley, bulgur, beans, potatoes, peas, oatmeal, and some whole grain breakfast cereals. Um, and these are more kind of those grain-based types of carbs. You do get carbohydrates from fruits and dairy products as well. Um, and they are also as equally as good carbohydrate sources. They are very nutrient dense. Um, so uh, yeah, but moving on past the carbs, let's go on now to the proteins. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on protein because it seems like there's a lot of misinformation and misconceptions about protein out there. And so I thought maybe a little more understanding would be helpful. And so first, if you look at what does protein, what is it in the body, right? Like when you're thinking about protein in the body, we're talking about tissues, including muscles, which I think most of us think about, but it's also what's what enzymes are composed of. And that helps facilitate the reactions in the body, including the metabolism of food, which can be incredibly helpful when you're doing a sport. Um, hormones, your body's messengers, and as we know, for our young teenagers, or our teenagers, those hormone levels can be all over the place. And we need to be maximizing the food intake, the dietary intake, to give them as much help as possible to get through um, that time in their life. And then antibodies for the proper immune function. And of course, that's hugely helpful because if you're sick, you're not going to perform. But if you can prevent illness, then um, and your, if your antibodies are working at their very best, then that can help prevent you from getting sick. Um, next slide. So let's break protein down. So what we're talking about is the building blocks are called amino acids, and there's 20 of them, but nine are essential, meaning you have to get the nine from the diet. And so those are essential for the athletic recovery and muscle building. And I think what sometimes my patients will forget is they're so focused on building muscle that they forget the faster you recover from your workouts, the harder you can work out the next day. And so, um, or as um, Dr. McGreeny and John were talking about, if you're on the sidelines because you're, because you're injured, well, the faster you can get the inflammation down and, and food isn't, you know, it's very helpful. It's not going to do, um, it is helpful. It's not like a medication. It's not like a procedure. It's not going to be as fast as those things. But I do think it could be one part, an important step um, for the athlete, um, for helping them, you know, work out at their very top potential and also then meeting their, reaching their best potential. Um, so, and next slide, please. <clears throat> 
but let's talk more about protein the recommended how to eat the protein so i have so many patients come in and they eat one or two big meals a day they are teenagers they get up late they get to school they're barely eating all day long and they get home and they have a massive dinner and um, unfortunately for them they only can use 25 grams approximately 25 to 30 grams of the protein at a time so that means if they're getting easily you could get 60 grams 70 80 grams of protein at that dinner but unfortunately you're only using 25 to 30 grams of that as amino acids you will use the rest either as energy if you need that as energy or it'll be stored as fat and so then what the goal is to try to move that protein into earlier in the day, into that breakfast, lunch, snack time, so you could actually use protein as amino acids. <clears throat> and so what I'll tell um, my patients that come in that maybe they're getting three, four or five grams of protein in the morning before they head out for their day, and maybe that could be their one goal. What would be one change they could make to add a little bit more, kind of move that protein into a more lower protein area and, or time of day. Um, and so looking at four to five separate doses of protein throughout the day, then you get to actually use those amino acids for um, re really the reason why you're eating them. So next slide, please. And then post-exercise, it is important to have a food containing protein. We used to think you had to have it within 30 minutes of of your workout, but um, research in nutrition has shown that it could be more like that 45 minutes to two hours after. And so if your athlete perhaps is is finishing up their um, their workout at around that 5.30, 6 o'clock time, then they're heading home and having dinner, that, that works out very nicely um, to, to get the protein that because uh, it's like the muscles are just ready for it. And that's a really good time to have carbohydrate source too, um, because again, the body um, after the workout um, is really gonna use those nutrients efficiently and, and that's what we wanna see. So next slide, please. So some examples would be, if you're looking at um, lean proteins, there's sort of the animal-based ones, which are more the fish, the shellfish, poultry, lean meats, deli meats, eggs. If you're looking at more of the plant-based ones, soy, which can include soybeans, tofu, edamame, some beans, black garbanzo beans, kidney pinto beans, um, and then dairy, low-fat cheese, uh, milk, yogurt, that type of thing. Now, there is quite a bit of research showing the anti-inflammatory properties of the plant-based proteins, and so it's something to consider and I'm always like, let's take it one step at a time. You know, we don't need to, I don't, I don't know, we don't need to change everything at once. And so if you have an athlete that's just having a hard time eating any kind of protein, I wouldn't really get picky with it. But if you have um, a, a young person that is very open, enjoys lots of different types of foods, um, I would encourage more plant-based proteins. Um, I think there's very good research supporting um, the anti-inflammatory properties, and there's no question if you can keep the inflammation down, all it can do is help with performance. So next slide, please. Fruits and vegetables, extremely powerful antioxidants, um, and their anti-inflammatory properties are amazing. If you can encourage your kids to eat, I have a list, but any of them, you know, don't try to ignore like social media sites that say this fruit's better or this vegetable's better. They're all good. All the different colors have different antioxidants and different phytonutrients. And so the more color, the better. And I think it makes the, the plate look gorgeous, honestly. That's when your color comes out, is when you have these different types of fruits and veggies and, and enjoy the spreads with them. I have so many patients saying, well, I would eat a carrot or I'd eat celery if I can have it with ranch dressing. And I'm like, you know what? Enjoy your ranch dressing with your vegetables. If that's a way, you know, encouraging different ways. Um, and kids so often enjoy the, the veggies with the dips and different types of things like that. So um, I highly encourage um, the fruits and veggies all day long, honestly. So next slide. 
And so fats, um, fats are important. And I have a list here of why. Um, so it maintains body temperature, it supports immune function, cushions and protects your organs, fac facilitates nerve transmission, <clears throat> assists in vitamin absorption. I can't tell you how many patients have come in where the labs are a little bit off, and then you find out the diet. It, it just the diet is so low in fat, it's just not, they're not able to absorb the, the nutrients that they need. Um, and it's a great source of energy. Fats, like for example, peanut butters or avocado, and I'll go into those, but they, um, especially for the kids that are underweight and they're just not getting the calories, fats are really a great way to add calories where they don't have to eat as much food. And it's excellent for long-term, low-intensity aerobic activities. Um, so that could be more like um, the runner or um, I'm trying to think of more of those aerobic activities where um, they are in an aerobic type of situation, um, whereas hockey and that type would be more anaerobic. So um, anyway, those ones where it's uh, low intensity, but long-term, um, they could be very helpful. Uh, so next slide, please. Some examples of fats. Now, so the salmon would be good for the protein and for omega-3 fatty acids, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory, and then of course for the fats, tuna, mackerel. The nuts and seeds and nut butters, they are higher in the healthy fats. They do contain some proteins as well, um, olives, olive oil, canola oils, the salad dressings and the avocado are all higher. Um, all higher in fat um, and really can be delicious additions to food. Um, next slide. Fluids, staying well hydrated. Hopefully you're hitting the water and staying away from more of those um, added sugar-based drinks. The added sugars are tough and I know the kids like them. Um, if you can decrease those as much as possible, um, added sugars increase inflammation. It's just, there's just no question. But the better, no matter what though, if um, to keep the child hydrated and you know if they're hydrated, if their urine color is um, pale and it doesn't smell, if it's yellow and it stinks, then they need to drink more, hopefully, water. Um, and that's, you know, there's a lot of recommendations out there, but really your body shows you, it tells you um, if you're well hydrated or not. The only caution though is if you've taken a supplement then it's going to affect probably the color of your urine. So I wouldn't check right after that. So next slide. So what are the rewards of all this? You have increased energy during your activity. Um, you have decreased risk of injury. So it keeps you on the playing field longer and you have better recovery. So it's, it, it's pretty nice rewards um, for that. So next slide. So this slide and the next slide are some reliable consumer nutrition information sites. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at those if you're interested. And these slides will be available for you. So um, you can, um, I think that uh, will be, Amber will be putting those on YouTube. And so that will be available. And then Amber, a couple more slides. So again, um, then one more slide. So there's a couple pages of sources, and then my name's Julie, and both John and I, um, we do do 15 minutes. John does, you know, injury screens. I do uh, nutrition screens. Those are free. They could be by, well, probably not for John. For me, it could be by phone, on computer, um, in person, and we can just answer your questions for you. Or you could always email me as well.